The crossbow. Certainly an impressive piece of machinery. Has a long and complex history. The origins of the crossbow are somewhat uncertain, but it is thought to have emerged in China around the 5th century BC. In China, during the Warring States period, up to the conclusion of the Han Dynasty, crossbows were a dominant weapon in the military, with formations including up to 30 to 50 percent pure crossbowmen. And it's no wonder. Going up against a formation of crossbows was a daunting task, and getting that bolt out of the side of your head, well, good luck doing that. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. I'm the ASMR historian, and today I'm going to tell you all about Chinese crossbows. Why not European crossbows? Well, simply because the Chinese had them for a very long time, and they didn't want to share the fun with our European friends, keeping the crossbows all to themselves. While this is rather unfortunate, it leaves us with a rather interesting tale of the early days of this ancient superweapon, as mysterious as it was powerful. So, without any further ado, I'd invite you to get relaxed, and we can begin. First, I will give you a brief introduction before we get into the specifics, and tell you mainly about Chinese crossbows, but a little bit about how crossbows developed in medieval Europe. Well, we will get there in a later video. In the Western world, the crossbow, specifically the gastrophets, was detailed by Heron of Alexandria in the first century AD, predating the catapult and indicating its suggested use before the 4th century BC. Well, evidence of crossbows in ancient Europe is, of course, very scant, with only a few references and artifacts suggesting their use, primarily for hunting rather than warfare, until they began to appear in historical records in 947, during the Siege of Senlis. Crossbows gained prominence in medieval European militaries from the 11th century AD, except of course in England, where the longbow was much preferred, and doing a very good job of keeping the French away. By the 16th century, gunpowder weapons began to overshadow military crossbows, though they did remain in use for hunting for another century due to their quiet operation. You don't want to scare all the other animals away, don't you? Now, the hypothesis that medieval European crossbows were influenced by Chinese designs is supported by some, though there are notable differences in the trigger mechanisms of the two regions' crossbows. And just before we do go on, I'd like to mention just some of the terminology that we will be using. Individuals specializing in the use of crafting of crossbones are often referred to as arbalists or arbalests. The terms arrow, bolt, and quarrel are all acceptable references to the projectiles fired from crossbows. The component known as the lath or prod serves as the crossbow's bow part. The term prod 
became common in the 19th century due to a mistranslation of rod from a 16th century inventory of crossbow materials. The stock, which is the wooden frame that supports the bow, is also historically called a tiller in medieval contexts. The mechanism responsible for the crossbow's firing, including the string, sears, trigger lever, and its casing, is collectively known as the lock. So, with that terminology in mind, don't you think it's time that we get into Chinese crossbows specifically? Trust me, it's going to be great. Well, let's go back to the Warring States period, where everyone's mind was solely on conflict, or perhaps trying to avoid it. Those who were interested in winning the battles, of course, wanted to have as many tricks up their sleeves as possible. Well, this necessity for innovation, of course, gives us the topic for the video today. During the Warring States period, the evolution of crossbow technology in China was marked by significant archaeological discoveries, shedding light on its early use and development. Cast bronze crossbow locks, dating to around 650 BC, have already been unearthed in various locations, offering concrete evidence of the crossbow's ancient origins. These artifacts were found in areas rich with historical significance, such as the tombs in Chufu, Shandong, which was once the capital of the state of Lu, one of the big players in the Warring States period, dating to the 6th century BC. High technology for the time Further supporting the crossbow's antiquity, bronze bolts from the mid-5th century BC were discovered at a burial site in Yutaishan, Jiangling County, Hubei Province, associated with the neighboring Chu state. So it wasn't just the Lu people who were dominating with this. Many other states also had this technology not so useful when your enemies have it as well. Well, these findings, along with others from Sao Ba Tang in Hunan province, dating to the mid-4th century BC, indeed suggest that the crossbow was a prominent weapon of the era, possibly even using spherical pellets as ammunition this notion is echoed in historical texts, where Jing Fang, a Western Han mathematician, likened the moon's shape to a round crossbow bullet, indicating the crossbow's various use in society. The crossbow's mention in early Chinese literature further underscores its importance in ancient military strategies. Texts from the 4th to the 3rd centuries BC, attributed to followers of Mozi, describe the utilization of a giant crossbow, hinting at its role in conflicts during the late spring and autumn period. Sun Tzu's seminal work, The Art of War, dating from around 500 to 300 BC, delves into the crossbow's characteristics and tactical applications, equating a drawn crossbow's potential to pure might. This recognition of the crossbow's strategic value 
is evidenced by the state of Chu's deployment of elite armored crossbow units, capable of enduring long marches, a testament to the weapon's significance in enhancing a force's mobility and endurance. Think about it. If you're firing those small pellets, or indeed the bolts, you could carry a lot more ammunition than you could if you were carrying those long arrows. And it would weigh less too. Of course the crossbow was made from different materials and perhaps may weigh a little more than a wooden bow, but its effectiveness was a lot better, at least at close ranges. The crossbow's prominence continued into the Han dynasty, where it was a highly favored weapon. As indicated by surviving inventory lists from Gansu and Xinjiang, showcasing a preference for crossbows over bows, especially in defense. You imagine people trying to break down the walls and you could easily go through those small little holes and shoot them with the crossbow rather than having to wind up a shot from a traditional bow. Very, very convenient. Well, this period of the Han Dynasty also saw advancements in crossbow design and production, including the use of more durable materials, like mulberry wood and brass, enhancing the weapon's effectiveness and its reliability. Mass production in state armories allowed for widespread distribution, with crossbows being used in significant numbers from the Qin dynasty onward, highlighting their critical role in Han military strategy. A soldier of the Han was required to master the crossbow with a considerable draw weight to qualify as a crossbowman. This underscores the weapon's integral role in the era's military preparedness and tactics. At this point, the crossbow was sought after a lot more and deemed as more important than traditional archery. That being said, archery had its own uses if we're going to talk about traditional bows, particularly over longer distances. The detailed advice on crossbow shooting provided by Chen Yin in the 2nd century AD encapsulates the meticulous skill and discipline required to effectively wield the weapon. It wasn't easy, but Chen Yin made it known that once you would master this skill, you would certainly do very, very well against the enemy. His guidance emphasizes stability, focus, and the harmonious coordination of the body's movements, reflecting the crossbow's complexity and the high level of expertise necessary for its mastery. This comprehensive approach to crossbowmanship illustrates the weapon's rather sophisticated nature, where precision and skill were paramount. Let's hear a little bit about what Chen Yin had to say. We can quote from his work, Wu Yue Qingzhou. When shooting, the body should be as steady as a board, and the head mobile like an egg on a table, the left foot forward and the right foot perpendicular to it, the left hand as if leaning against a branch, the right hand as if embracing a child, then grip 
the crossbow and take sight of the enemy. Hold the breath and swallow. Then breathe out as soon as you have released the arrow. In this way, you will be unperturbable. Thus, after deep concentration, the two things separate, the arrow going and the bow staying. When the right hand moves the trigger in releasing the arrow, the left hand should not know it. One body, yet different functions of parts, like a man and a girl well matched, such as the Tao of holding the crossbow and firing accurately. Following the Han dynasty, the crossbow saw a decline in its military prominence, only to witness a modest revival during the Tang dynasty. During this era, the optimal composition of an expeditionary force of 20,000 included a contingent of 2,200 archers, along with 2,000 crossbowmen. Highlighting a strategic balance between these ranged combatants. Remember when I mentioned long-range and short-range effectiveness. Military strategists Li Jing and Li Chuan recommended that 20% of infantry forces be equipped with standard crossbows, noting their accuracy over considerable distances. Up to half of shots would hit a target at 345 meters, with an effective range closer to 225 meters. Still not bad. This demonstrates the crossbow's continued tactical value in engagements, requiring precision at range. The Song Dynasty, however, marked a period of regulatory efforts aimed at controlling the proliferation of military-grade crossbows, with the government preventing to seek the ownership of both armor and crossbows by civilians. Come and take it, huh? Despite these restrictions, the crossbow found renewed popularity among the civilian population, serving both as a tool for hunting and as a fun activity. Affluent young individuals and those with time to spare formed their very own shooting clubs, turning crossbow practice into a rather fashionable pastime. While well, this certainly indicates the weapons, integration into cultural and social activities beyond the battlefield, don't you think? By the late Ming dynasty, the production of crossbows had significantly dwindled, as evidenced by records indicating no crossbows were manufactured between the years of 1619 and 1622. Zero. Instead, the Ming Dynasty's armament production focused heavily on firearms and artillery. Of course, they were getting very popular at the time. With a substantial output of cannons, guns, muskets, and other weaponry, signaling a shift towards more modern forms of warfare. This transition reflects the evolving dynamics of military technology, of course, but it doesn't mean that the crossbows were just thrown away. Well, they were still using them, of course, they were effective, but times had to change. 
The mechanics of using military-grade crossbows evolved over time to improve efficiency and the ease of use. Initially, crossbows were armed by treading, that's physically stepping on the bow stave and drawing the string with the user's arms and back. Hard work, if you've ever loaded a crossbow before. The Song Dynasty, however, somewhat refined that idea, and introduced stirrups to facilitate this process, reducing the strain on the bow and the archer, and also enabling a more efficient draw. For larger crossbows, a belt claw mechanism allowed for drawing while lying down though this method was a lot less common. The largest of the crossbows, mounted versions, employed winch drawing mechanisms, underscoring the diversity of techniques developed to maximize the weapon's effectiveness across different contexts and scales of use. Well, the crossbow throughout its history certainly seems to have been a weapon of contrast, offering distinct advantages and disadvantages. Can you think of any disadvantages? I'm sure you have a few in mind, just by looking at it and learning about the drawing back and reloading. Well, its ability to pierce through hard materials and achieve semi-long-range shots made it an invaluable tool in defending strategic locations such as mountain passes, where the need to counteract noise and forceful assaults was paramount. The mechanical strength of the crossbow allowed archers to use bows with greater draw strength more accurately, thanks to the stability that the crossbow provided. However, and these are the disadvantages, the crossbow's slower rate of fire, due to the time-consuming process of arming the bow, posed significant challenges, especially in the face of sudden or close-range attacks. A crossbowman could only discharge his weapon a limited number of times before the battle closed to melee range, where hand-to-hand -hand weapons would obviously prevail. This limitation led some to question the crossbow's utility in fast-paced combat scenarios. Yet the issue was not inherently with the crossbow, but rather the tactical employment of crossbowmen by commanders who failed to fully leverage the weapon's strengths. Critics from the Tang Dynasty era argued that crossbows offered no advantage over melee weapons and advocated for frontline troops to be equipped with long spears and shields to counter charges, relegating crossbowmen only to the roles that maximize their potential. Well, of course, it's obvious, isn't it? Crossbows aren't going to be good in every situation. The strategic deployment of crossbows, as observed by Chao Tzu in 169 BC, highlighted their effectiveness against the Xiongnu. They were the uh, barbarians, kind of near Mongolia, on the steppes. While this emphasized the crossbow's superiority in range and penetrative power compared to short bows, this war against the Xiongnu made people examine 
whether they were going to use bows or move on to the more modern crossbows. The formation tactics involving crossbows, such as forming a lager to repel cavalry attacks, and employing disciplined units to alternate between shooting and reloading, demonstrated a sophisticated understanding of how to integrate crossbows into broader military strategies. Shooting techniques that were not seen until the Napoleonic era, mm, very before, or rather ahead of its time. Now, medieval Europe, let's just talk about that a little bit. In medieval Europe, the crossbow's role as an anti-cavalry weapon was recognized, with recommendations for its use against Mongol invasions. China had enough problems of its own dealing with the Mongols. By the time the Mongols got to Europe, well, China was already experiencing new management. The crossbow's efficacy was demonstrated in battles where elite crossbowmen were capable of targeting and eliminating key figures. Think about like a sniper, almost. Such as the Liao Dynasty general Xiao Talin, showcasing the weapon's potential in skilled hands. The crossbow's impact on warfare, therefore, was multifaceted, offering significant advantages in terms of power, range, and tactical versatility, but requiring careful consideration of its limitations and strategic deployment to fully realize its potential. According to historical accounts documented in the Wu Yue Chunqiu during the Eastern Han Dynasty, the concept of a repeating crossbow emerged during the Warring States period. Credited to Mr. Qin from the state of Chu. That's right, multiple bolts. Bang, bang, bang. That's certainly frightening. This assertion finds support in archaeological findings, notably from the excavation of a tomb in Qinjiazui, in Hubei province, with the earliest evidence of repeating crossbows dating back to the 4th century BC was unearthed. Unlike their later iterations, these ancient double-shot repeating crossbows featured a pistol-like grip and a rear pulling mechanism for arming. Subsequent developments in the Ming Dynasty introduced a different arming mechanism, requiring users to manipulate a rear lever in an upward and downward motion. While handheld repeating crossbows of this era were relatively weak, and often supplemented with additional poisons such as aconite for damage over time and enhanced lethality, larger mounted versions, big ones on the backs of chariots, became prevalent during the Ming Dynasty, and they were huge. Now back to the repeating crossbows. A notable example of the tactical utilization of them occurred around 180 AD, when Yang Xuan, Grand Protector of Ling Ling, faced a challenge suppressing rebel activity with limited forces. Employing an innovative approach, Young loaded numerous wagons with lime sacks, 
and equipped others with automatic crossbows. These wagons, deployed strategically, exploited the wind to disperse the lime dust, creating a blinding effect on the enemy. By igniting rags tied to the tails of horses pulling the wagons, the rebels' confusion was further compounded. The repeating crossbows, linked to the movement of wheels, unleashed volleys of projectiles in random directions, causing significant casualties among the already confused and disoriented adversaries. Pretty cool, huh? In the ensuing chaos, the rebels inadvertently inflicted harm upon themselves before succumbing to Yang's forces. Now, contrary to popular belief, the invention of the repeating crossbow isn't attributed to Zhuge Liang. And if you don't know about Zhuge Liang, well, you'll just have to wait for my video on him. Fascinating character. Very quickly, he was a very intelligent general. Well, despite a common misconception based on records suggesting his involvement in improving multiple bolt crossbows, he never came up with the idea. Now, later on during the Ming Dynasty, repeating crossbows found utility even in naval warfare, as evidenced by several historical accounts. However, of course, the world always changes, and as firearms gained prominence, repeating crossbows gradually fell out of favour, signalling their eventual obsolescence by the late Qing Dynasty. Qing Dynasty ended in the very early 1900s. The emergence of firearms rendered them ineffective by comparison, leading to their decline in military use. But those shooting clubs among the upper class as well, they were still quite popular. Now, large mounted crossbows, known as bed crossbows, made their debut as early as the Warring States period, as described by Mordza who portrayed them as defensive weapons, strategically positioned atop battlements. These formidable siege implements were further elaborated upon in Moist writings, where they were depicted as massive devices with frameworks towering taller than a man, capable of launching arrows attached to cords for easy retrieval. By the time of the Han Dynasty, crossbows had evolved into multiple field artillery variations, earning the moniker of military strong carts for their adaptability and effectiveness in various combat scenarios. Innovations in crossbow design continued to emerge particularly around the 5th century AD, with the development of double and triple crossbows. Achieved by combining multiple bows to increase draw weight and length. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Well, it is as cool as it sounds. Tang Dynasty iterations of these weapons boasted very impressive ranges. You wouldn't believe it, some accounts claim distances of up to 1,060 meters. And this is supported by historical sources, not just from the Chinese, 
Well, for example, we have Atta Malik Juvayani's observation of similar weapons used by the Mongols in 1256. Juvayani's accounts of Hulagu Khan's siege of Nishapur and Mamun Diz detail the deployment of giant crossbows imported from China. That's right, not a Mongolian invention, a Chinese import. And they were also manned by skilled Chinese technicians, capable of launching large bolts over vast distances. So, before you say made in China is bad quality, well, the size of the Mongolian Empire may beg to differ. Now another source, the Wu Jing Zongyao, provides further insight into the capabilities of this weapon, citing ranges of 450 meters, though other Song Dynasty sources suggest even greater distances, underscoring the technological advancements achieved in crossbow engineering during the Song Dynasty. The construction and operation of these massive crossbows demanded unparalleled technical expertise, particularly in the casting of the large triggers, highlighting the pinnacle of technological sophistication attainable at the time. Primarily used from the 8th to the 11th century AD, these colossal and rather comically huge crossbows played a significant role in shaping siege warfare tactics and fortification strategies embodying the ingenuity and martial prowess of an ancient civilization. The multiple bolt crossbow emerged around the late 4th century BC, as evidenced by historical records dating all the way back to 320. These records described its deployment on three-wheeled carriages stationed atop ramparts. Utilizing a treadle for drawing, this formidable weapon discharged arrows measuring up to three meters in length. With alternating drawing mechanisms such as winches and even oxen also employed. Of course, to shoot a bolt three meters long, you had to draw the bow back pretty far. Well, despite its capacity to unleash multiple bolts, its accuracy was compromised due to the varying trajectories resulting from bolts positioned off-center along the bowstring. You can't have it all, right? Take the good with the bad. Though I tend to think, if someone saw a three meter long arrow flying towards them, regardless of the accuracy, it would be somewhat demoralizing. An intriguing anecdote that I want to mention involving the multiple bolt crossbow is recounted in the tale of Qin Shi Huang, that was the first emperor of China, encounter with supposed monsters obstructing communication with mystical beings. I have to remind you that Qin Shi Huang had some eccentricities, let's say. Well, he had decided to take matters into his own hands, and the emperor himself ventured forth armed with a multiple bolt crossbow, only to discover no monsters, but he did succeed in dispatching a rather large fish. Not bad for a day's work, gotta shoot something. Well, it might not be killing monsters, 
but it's enough to show what a crossbow can do. Historical accounts from 99 BC attest to the deployment of multiple bolt crossbows as field artillery against nomadic cavalry. Despite common misconception, the invention of the repeating crossbow is often erroneously attributed to Zhuge Liang. Well, there is good reason to think so. As you mentioned, he was very intelligent. But these same sources, the ones that mention Zhuge Liang as the inventor, provide some other insights. It attempts to clarify his involvement in the development of a multi-bolt crossbow capable of simultaneously launching ten iron bolts, each measuring twenty centimeters in length. Now, to my knowledge, we have not found one of these. I certainly hope that we do. But as of yet, we don't have any archaeological findings. And due to the same misconception in the same source that attributes Zhuge Liang as the inventor of the crossbow, well, we have to take this ten-bolt crossbow with quite a large grain of salt. But let's cross our fingers and hope that we do find something. Well, in the subsequent centuries, further advancements in multiple bolt crossbow technology were also documented, such as Li Chuan's description in 759 AD of an arcubalista capable of demolishing ramparts and city towers with its devastating firepower. And don't forget Tao Gu's account in 950 highlighting innovations in trigger mechanisms, with soldiers utilizing interconnected triggers to unleash volleys of bolts simultaneously, striking fear into the hearts of adversaries, and also striking bolts into the heart of adversaries, which is somewhat worse. Well, it all had to end. By 1530 AD, the multiple bolt crossbow, if not for all of its coolness, had become completely obsolete, supplanted by the evolving military technologies at the time. Nonetheless, its legacy endures as a testament to ancient ingenuity. You have to admit that it is extremely impressive and its significant contributions to the evolution of siege warfare tactics and battlefield strategy. Thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed our video today, then perhaps you would give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and leave your comments below. Say hello. I always reply back. Unless this video blows up and gets a million comments. Perhaps I won't be able to respond to all of them. That would be a nice problem to have. But until then, once again, I'll wish you all the best. Good luck out there. You're doing great. I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone.